You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live every Friday at 1.30 p.m. Central, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike Options Pricing and Analysis Software. Quick Strike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy to use web based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page-level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. Quick Strike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. Quick Strike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. That's B A N T I X. Com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Quick Strike One. That's Q U I K S T R I K E One. This week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. I love that tune because it means it's time for TWIFO this week in Futures Options, a program where pretty much the name says it all. We break down the week that was and still is in some cases from a futures options trading and trending and volatility and unusual activity and skew and all sorts of other fun perspectives. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from a little thing I like to call the old Options Insider Radio Network. You guys know where to find all 10 dozen or so of our programs out there. We've got quite a few, somewhere between 10 and a dozen. I haven't counted up in a while. Uh, so check them out on your favorite platform of choice, your iTunes, your TuneIn, your Stitchers. Or of course, head on over to our site, theoptionsinsider.com. It's all available there. If you want to go deep into our archives, going all the way back to 2007, well, then, of course, the website or, indeed, our mobile app, are the places for you. And of course, if you like it immediate, you want to hear it right now, the Mixler feed, we go live every Friday, 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern via Mixler. And of course, we also post the recording of that live stream up there on Mixler as well. So if for some reason you can't make the live feed, but you still don't want, can't wait for the podcast, you want to get it that quick, then you can grab that version up there. It doesn't have all the cool bells and whistles of the podcast, but hey, it'll, it'll get you tidied over while you're doing your commute home or whatever it is you're doing out there. And of course, 
course, however you're listening, live after the fact, hit us up. Questions, comments, insights, you guys always do a great job of that. Keep it coming. And joining me to help tackle your myriad futures options questions and also discuss the latest and greatest in the world of futures options, my cohort, my partner in crime over there from the HQ of Bantix Technologies, the creator of Quickstri Quickstrike, easy for me to say today. Luckily, it's the last show on the network for this week. The creator of Quickstrike, Mr. Nick Howard. Nick, welcome back to Twifo, sir. How are things going out there in the hinterlands of Chicago? Hey, going okay. The, my uh, my phone started ringing with my Skype as I was walking back in town from lunch at 128, and so I was sprinting to my office, and then all I hear is music when I finally get to the when I get to the phone. I thought I was late, late for the show, but <laughs> go, go, going going okay. That's what going you get okay. for having lunch at 128. It's showtime, sir. There's no time for lunch. Oh, it was a 12 1230 lunch. So it just, you know, just uh, meetings run long and that's what happens. And hey, at least it's sunny out. So uh, there you go. Uh, at least it's nice got. out there. You got to do what we do here in the studio. Iron Man all the way through to like three. Then you have lunch. Uh, you know, there's, there's no eating and broadcasting, sir. That's true. That's true. Only only drinking uh, liquids to uh, to uh, to uh, smooth your vocal cords yes, out, right? Yes. So you can have some good chat. Copious, copious amounts of liquids. You guys should see the volume that goes down in the studios here. And then after Twifo, after the shows are done, when we have guests in the studio, there's all sorts of other adult beverages that come out. But that's for later. That's for after the shows. First off, let's get to it. Nick, it's been a crazy week out here across we can kind of just almost flip a coin or look at the uh look at the movers and shakers over there in quick strike and just kind of pick our what's been moving and shaking at cme this week by the way you guys can follow along live at the reports cmegroup.com slash twifo t-w-i-f-o head on over there and look at all these cool reports and nick and i are actually talking about during the show you can see exactly if you want to say hey what was the action on those 60 puts in wti well you can go do that for yourself over there cmegroup.com slash twifo and i think we it's, it's kind of a an embarrassment of riches a bit this this week in terms of how many products were active i think we'll start off because one's making a lot of headlines this week again and uh, of course we had our, our friend uh, shy girl on last week we were talking a lot of crude last week but it seems like it's in the headlines again so i think we'll start there just because uh, it is moving and shaking it's an interesting week from a crude perspective, you know, we had one thing going on in the broad equity markets, and then crude was kind of, seemed like it was doing its own thing for a little bit there. Then, of course, on Wednesday, we saw a pretty much what well, at the time was about a three-and-a-half-year high uh, for crude after we saw kind of a bit of a surprise fall in uh, the U.S. stocks out there. So, you know, you know, whenever you're talking crude, and we say this every week, it's kind of a bit of a push-pull. What the heck is OPEC doing? What are they up to versus the domestic supply situation and demand situation? And it seems like uh, the surprise side <laughs> of the supply uh, fell off a little bit here. Uh, so we saw crude rallying a little bit. And then, of course, uh, Roger, I pretty much were these levels right here, through 68 and a half. Uh, then, of course, we saw it uh, retreating a little bit today <laughs> earlier today at least after uh after the president the, pre the commander in chief decided to weigh in on crude uh, he weighs in a lot of things he hasn't really weighed in on crude too much but today he chimes in saying uh, looks like opec is at it again with record amounts of oil all over the place including the fully loaded ships at sea oil prices are artificially very high in caps no good and will not be accepted. <laughs> so after dialing back the trade war talk, sounds like he's ratcheting up the rhetoric on OPEC to perhaps um, take a little bit of a break on, uh, on, uh, on what they're doing over there. All this kind of combines to pretty much have crude setting out the week here pretty much exactly where it was back on Wednesday, which is right around those three and a half year highs, right around 68 and a half net up week to week about a handle. So from where we were about a week ago, we're up about a handle, 68 and a half right now. Uh, that's about one and a half percent out there in the futures land. Nick, you were right on the ball last week when we were talking about how crude ball had gotten a bit of a bid, and we speculated that maybe, you know, we don't say this too often in crude, but maybe last week was the time maybe you could actually sell a little bit of that ball because it did seem to be a little bit short-lived, and lo and behold, that worked out pretty well, Nick. Yeah, I mean, it's not as, it's not as down as far as... Um as maybe we would have thought it would have been, but, but uh, it, you know, two things happened, right? The market came off right away at the beginning of the week and then um, made a bit of a move back to the unch territory, at least from what it looks like um, right now. So, so yeah. Um, well, you know, Tracy also had, she thought it was a little bit, uh, a little bit overdone as well. So, 
and she was right there. And if anybody who was short after the show probably did okay from a cover, um, uh, as the, as the week began. So, so we'll see. I mean, this, this guy spouting off about OPEC, uh, he probably doesn't even know what the acronym stands for, but, uh, but you know, and he probably capitalized it to emphasize it as opposed to capitalizing it because it was an acronym, because the more you capitalize things, the more important they are in any case. Yes. Yeah. We, we were close to, uh, we were close in terms of, uh, being right about the vol, but yeah, you know, not as not as much as we thought. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it has been kind of a bit of a pattern with crude vol. You know, we see usually it's a sell off that drives the vol up. You know, last week we saw the vol coming up, and uh, it's always been very short lived. It hasn't really lasted too long. A lot, a lot of people out there would love for crude vol to come back and stay for a bit. We know, of course, uh, we're still well below where we were back when crude was much higher, and of course, and you know, it was just a different volatility regime. Now we're kind of in that relatively paltry anemic crude vol regime and it seems like we're going to be there for some time uh even though you're right wasn't the aggressive retracement we've seen after recent uh, vol run-ups but still coming in a bit kind of across the board and if there all this action crude settling out around 68 and a half you're probably saying to yourself you know what was the uh the hot number one with the bullet strike out there in wti this week well if you said to yourself it was the june 70s then Give yourself a little pat on the back. By the way, open interest, uh, pretty robust this week, up nearly 7%. So that's pretty active. And uh, all the volume out here this week, about 56% going up in that front month contract. So a lot of action out there in the, uh, in the old June contract. Like I said, 50, almost 50,000, 48,000 of these 70 calls going up in June this week. So a lot of interest, a lot of, you know, crude tends to, liquidity tends to aggregate around these very kind of straightforward, no-nonsense levels, 60, 65, and now 70. And it, I was joking not, not that long ago on the show, Nick, that it seemed like the 70 action we saw a couple months ago, that seemed like such a, such, such a long road to hoe to get to 70. Now here we are, uh, you know, uh, 68 and a half, we're within spitting distance of 70. Uh, so it is funny how the narrative has changed on crude in not that long, in like a month or so. Again, the 70 calls lighting it up, almost 50,000, uh, nearly 16,000 going up on Wednesday. That's where the Lions should actually tie, kind of 16,000 each Wednesday and Thursday. So active days on both of those. The rest kind of scattered throughout the week. Uh, and as you might imagine, a lot of back and forth on that strike. Are we going to get there? Oh, no, we're retreating on Wednesday. Oh, we're back up there again. Oh, no, we're coming back. So, you know, it seemed like there was a lot of uh, push and pull getting close. Maybe we're going to threaten that 70 strike. Oh, no, not so much. So that, that results in a lot of back and forth action on the strike. That's kind of what we saw about 4,500 contracts net changing hands opening on the week, but uh, for 70,000 or 50,000, uh, that's uh, not even a little bit more, not even 10% pretty much that uh, was net opening. So a lot of back and forth on that strike. Number two, uh, the if 70 is not optimistic enough for you, then the June 75s were lighting it up this week as well to the tune of 35,000, 13,000 on Thursday and about 12,000 on Wednesday. The rest, again, kind of scattered throughout the week. Again, about similar opening numbers, about 4,200 contracts net opening. So as much back and forth as there was on the 70s, also on the 75s, probably some verticals therein as well, kind of uh, lighting things up over there. Then we come off over here a little bit. People may be saying, what about the puts? Puts coming in number three this week. Again, a lot of this, pretty much all of this so far here in the June contract. The June 65 puts doing 20,000 contracts. Uh, kind of the lion's share actually yesterday, Thursday, 6,300. Uh, the rest kind of evenly split throughout the week. About 3,500 net opening there as well. So a lot of back and forth action on the 70 calls, 75 calls, and the 65 puts. Uh, not, let's see. Don't see the uh, 70 puts here in the top, which is kind of interesting. Uh, you think you might see a little bit of action there just because we threatened it. But again, those are in the money puts, so probably a little bit too rich for a lot of people's blood out there. Let's scroll down a little bit here. Number four, the 60 puts. So you got that nice little put strip going there as well. About 15,000 going there. The lion's share coming on Monday, actually, with 3,500. Uh, today, also pretty close, about 3,200 going up today as well. Uh, net about 3,000 opening on the week. So a little bit of opening action on the 60 puts. And let's just look a little bit farther afield here really quickly. Uh, the top five looks like all kind of front month this week with uh, the 68 calls rounding our top five, 15,000 
of those going up, about a third of those, the lion's share coming on Wednesday, 5,300. Net actually closing on the 68 calls this week, about 1,600, so a little bit of closing action uh, there, which is funny. 68 being at the money, you think it might be a little bit more active, but all the action was on the 70s this week, which, again, kind of is following and in keeping with what we see a lot out here in crew. Not to say there was no action in other months. Deese, the 70s, doing about 11,000 contracts there. Almost all of that yesterday, 8,200. Uh, kind of net on slightly opening there on the week total, but still uh, about 8,000 going up just yesterday alone in the 70s. In December, if you're saying to yourself, what about some more puts? Was there Were there no put players out there? There were a few. We saw the 50 puts out there in March 2019 doing a about uh, oh, about a thousand going up, kind of uh, throughout the week. About a thousand, pretty much a good chunk of that opening on the fifty puts in March 2019. So someone perhaps uh, protecting a little bit of the downside, maybe harvesting a little bit of premium. Also saw the double puts going out a year, the June 2019 puts also active with about 3,400 and change. Uh, pretty much all that opening as well. So there was some put action, but uh, the lion's share of the size paper was out there on the calls. By the way, for kind of extreme strikes, let's look here really quickly, see if anything kind of weird was out there. You know, we're not seeing the super crazy stuff as we've seen in the last weeks. It's like the most outlandish strike that did some decent size this week was the 85 calls out there in Dees 2019, doing about 2,000 contracts. All of that yesterday. Pretty much that's the only time it traded all week <laughs> and about uh, about half of that opening, which is interesting. Uh, but still, uh, not the no, not even the par calls lighting it up for any size or anything along those lines. So interesting stuff out there uh, this week. Mr. Nick, uh, we talked a little bit about the vol, perhaps not retracing as much as we thought. What caught your eye out there uh, from a skew perspective out there in WTI this week, sir? Yeah, so I, I had my report on last week, uh, and uh, just to check what uh, what kind of run up we got in vol, and you know we did have uh, a pretty good run up last week, like we mentioned that last Friday. I wanted to make sure what the magnitude of that was, but um, yeah, we didn't have we, we 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 see some red, we see some small green uh, upticks in the volatility. We don't see we see a little bits of change in the uh, in the at the money strike. We're up pretty much. Uh, one dollar uh in strike across the board here but um you know with no increase in volatility or a smite decrease decrease means that uh, our shorter dated options we're going to see some some time decay so there was uh, definitely some money made there for on our short premium uh positions um just based on the fact that we didn't see any you know if if vol is going to stay firm um you're going to see some increase in vol or if prices are going to stay firm you're going to see some increases in vol to get that premium up to where people were uh, trading it last week, but we didn't see that. So there was as much as the vol wasn't down, you still have your theta um, kind of uh, kicking in. So there is some money to be made. And, it is, and I remind, and I'll get to the skew thing real quick. But I remember in the in the pit, we would, you know, we would uh, make uh, straddle runs for the brokers, and and uh, the prices would be whatever two four. And the euro dollars was famous for maybe two four for a week. So you would come in on Friday, it would be 2-4, and then you'd go home for the weekend, and the next thing you know, you come back in, and the market would be 2-4 again. So obviously the volatility had to go up. And, and at the time, you're just thinking of it from a price standpoint, but then you, then now when you, and, and your sheets were always going up. So never looked at it, always look at it as premium levels, more so, because that's what you were, you were trading the premium, you're obviously trading the volatility, but when I think of it 2-4, 2-4, just always saying, never really paying attention to the fact that you know, um, inherently that the, the volatility was going up. So here we see the volatility not going down too much, uh, staying the same. Um, so not going to get too much, uh, not too much bang for the buck owning any of that, uh, any of those options uh, last week uh, from Friday to, to now. As far as the skew goes, we mentioned uh, last week how the calls got a little bit uh, firmer while the puts got offered a little bit. And I think uh, what we saw is some of that juice come out um, this week. And again, um, when, when we, it, it becomes more relevant of a conversation when we're looking like 90 days in, right? So we saw uh, a little bit of a, a push down in in the 25 delta. We we and and that's even more significant because we had a little bit of a move up in the in the future. So the curve probably was more of a shifting curve, and we had a little bit more of a spread uh, between the 25. You know, in terms of like if you took a piece of string and like stretched it out in the middle. 
you saw it flatten out a little bit more. So now we have our our puts and our calls are 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 uh, not entirely flat to that the money, but uh, but close. Um, you know, the calls came in uh, quite a bit uh, this week in comparison. So nothing too exciting. I mean, I think what was exciting was the, was the price action more than anything else um, to see how uh, it kind of came it came in on uh, Monday and, and uh, had a little bit of that push down. And then, um, you know, it was actually Sunday night. It had a push down. And then Monday early morning, you know, when the markets opened again. And then we had another push down to the lows on Tuesday. And then we kind of rallied right back up uh, Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday night into Thursday and then come back off again. So, uh, so yeah, not, not to, uh, not getting through getting to and not getting through that 70 mark. I don't think we're going to see volatility do much until we start to hit some of these barrier strikes like the 70 strike, but nothing too exciting from a skew standpoint other than calls gave back a little of the bid that they received last week. And that's probably due to the fact, obviously, that we kind of stayed within uh, a lower part of we moved down into the lower part of our range and kind of moved back up. And and until we see something more significant, we're not going to see anything interesting there. Yeah, it does seem like, you know, crude likes these uh, these moments of inflection when it comes to the skew. And I wonder if we break through 70, if we maybe we'll see one of those, Nick, if we'll see the skew start to uh, change up a little bit. Remember the last time we saw the really big change up with uh, crude skew was back. Oh, over a year ago now with the big November OPEC meeting that really kind of changed the paradigm for the supply cuts, you know, uh, and that seemed to change the game for a while. Maybe rallying past 70, you think that has enough legs to do it or maybe not? No, I, I think that's sort of a, a little bit of um, it's it's part of the conversations that we've had over the last eight months in terms of the high end of the ranges that we've talked about. Right. So I would think that if we do print over that, there's going to be a little bit of a maybe a little bit of a run. Although the funny thing is if you watch Twitter and I follow a lot of oil people and Tracy's one that uh, will tweet about it. There's this guy, do you know the, do you know the guy Gartman that's on TV and on the, on the yes. on, online yes. and do you know, know who I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah. Well, anyway, he's the, he's a fade, right? So he says one thing, everybody does the other thing. Cause he seems to always be wrong. Anyway, he admitted like he thought there was bear, oil was bearish and, and now he thinks that he's wrong and that, it's, um, you know, there's more upside to come. And then right after he said that, everybody's saying everybody sell, you know, do the opposite of what he said. So so maybe we're stuck. Maybe we're stuck in this pattern here because Garmin, Garmin got out of his uh, shorts and now he's long. So if that's any indication based on history, then we probably want to stay short the market here. But but yes, I would say that until we see something through that strike, because we haven't been really above that uh, in a while. I don't think we're going to see much else go on. You know, it's starting, the pain is starting to hit people at the pump when it's starting to ripple up all the way to the White House as a bit of a populist issue. Crude's got to be probably around that set. Maybe that 70 handle is where it is, where it starts to seep into the public consciousness because now it's hitting them in the pump. It's hitting them in some other areas. People starting to say, wait a minute, this massive SUV I just bought, it's kind of pricey to fill up. And so, uh, so yeah, when you see uh, Trump and the White House chiming in, maybe we're hitting that populist consensus level that Maybe crude in the near term is a little bit too high. Maybe there will be some pushback. So, you know, whenever you're talking crude, you have all these macro factors. Look at last week. It was a great example. A lot of the actual data was bearish. But then you have all those uh, political factors going on in the Middle East and issues there and Saudi Arabia intercepting missiles and everything else like that, which, you know, sent crude in the other direction. So uh, sometimes not just the numbers that tell the tale of crude. Speaking of numbers, Nick, there's a lot of things that were moving this week. You know, we could talk metals, we could talk maybe some ags or some other things. What was what was on your radar this week you really want to hit on a trifle this week? Uh, let's see if I have anything in particular that I feel like I want to do. My radar has always been on crude just because when we talk about it so much one week, we want to pay we want to pay uh, special attention uh, to it going forward, but you know, we go from the black gold to the shiny stuff. Let's Let's talk a little. We had a little bit of a, a move down here in uh, in gold. So why don't we why don't we give that a try? How like did how did do. I know you were going to go there, sir? It's like I already had it up on my screen, just just waiting for you to say the words. We're have, we're we're you know we're simpatico uh, on this show here. Yes, of course. Let's get over to the shiny stuff. Uh, the other side of the equation. You guys like a lot of gold. You also like a lot of crude. You also like a lot of gold talk. Uh, so we try to oblige you here. On the old show, as Nick alluded to, uh, gold taking it off a little bit this week, off about 10 handles, right around 1340 or so uh, net on the week, not even 1%, but still, I know for all you gold bugs, you feel every tick to the downside, so a 10-handle move 
It's got to hurt a little bit. So also, interestingly enough, we saw the uh, underlying coming in. We also saw, again, gold saw a nice little bump when it came to vol last week. And we've said many times on this show, you know, gold vol is pretty much at or around five-year lows. So any little bump in vol, kind of like crude, has been very short-lived. And that's kind of what we saw again with uh, gold vol coming off again. The gold VIX off about oh, one and a half handles almost this week. So vol just can't catch a bid for any sustainable amount of time out here in uh, in gold land. So something to keep an eye on. Again, all you people who write in saying, what's, gonna, what's going on with gold vol? When can we buy some gold vol? Uh, coming in again this week. In terms of overall action, again, it was a pretty robust week. Open interest up about 5% up there on the old, uh, the old COMEX there. Doing, again, about 5%. And of all that action, where all the lion's share of the volume was, was actually fairly fairly more evenly split than usual. Usually you see about 45, maybe 50% of the action in one particular trading month. This week, it was about a third coming in that, uh, that front May contract. Actually, a little bit less than a third, 31.5% out there with the number one trade out here actually not even coming in that contract, coming in uh, June. Like I said, we settled out right around 1340 out there. So you might say to yourself, self, you know, I would probably guess if I had to guess what was number one with the bullet in terms of the active options trap, I might say 13 half calls maybe. you That's not a bad guess, but you would indeed be off the mark. It was the 1400s. Yes, 1400s. Surprisingly active out of the money uh, calls here in gold this week. Doing about 10,000 and change. The lion's share actually coming on Wednesday, about 4,400 there, about 2,300 Thursday, kind of anemic today, about 1,500 on Monday. Net about 2,000 opening on the week. So people discovering this week the 1,400 strike uh, for some odd reason, uh, doing uh, a lot, a surprising amount of paper out there. Then we got to go back to the front month where the lion's share of the paper was going up this week. And we see number two is probably a strike you might expect. The 13 halves over there in May doing about 8,300 contracts on the week of the lion's share again yesterday, about 2,000 and change. Uh, a little bit less than that 1,800 on Wednesday. The rest kind of scattered, excuse me, throughout the week. Uh, closing actually, about 1,000 contracts closing on the 13 half. So net opening on the 1400s, net closing on the at the money is the 13 half, which is probably not what people would have expected. Certainly not myself. Uh, number 1375 is kind of splitting the difference coming in at number three there, doing about 7,000 contracts. The lion's share actually on Monday, about 2,700, 2,000 on Tuesday, the rest scattered throughout the week. Net opening there as well, about 1,500 contracts over there. On 1375s. Uh, number four, <laughs> you don't see this too often. The 1400s, also in that front month contract, doing exactly 5,000 contracts. Exactly, to a T. You never see that. Uh, 2250 going up yesterday, uh, whopping six going up today. Uh, net about 1,000 closing on the 1400s. So opening, uh, opening out there in the, uh, what was it, the June contract. And then uh, closing so much in the 1400s in the May contract. Interesting activity out here across the board. And number five on our top five. Let's see uh, what we've got here. Actually, looks like, actually, we're going to go out a little bit. Uh, it trumped it by a couple of hundred contracts. Actually, no, we're going to go farther out because this one actually should have been a little bit higher up. But it's so far down on the radar here. It's actually, it's got to June. Interesting week here for gold, Nick. I can't remember it being this scatter shot in quite some time. Uh, the 14 half calls here in March, March of 2019, doing 6,000. So this is actually probably like number three on our list here overall. Uh, pretty much all of that coming up yesterday, 6,000 going up yesterday, 2,000 of that opening. So someone uh, deciding 1,400, not enough, not bullish enough for them. They wanted to go up farther and they wanted to go up the strike chain more. So they said, hey, how about 6,000 of the 14 halves? I don't see any other paper. Yeah, no paper up to really make it any sort of ratio uh, so it looks like it's straight up 6,000 of the 14 halves, as it appears to be on the paper. So yeah, weird, interesting paper here across the board here, Nick. Let's just dig a little bit deeper before we dive into the skew, see if any other funky trades really getting on our radar here. Did see some puts active, 3,000 of the June uh, 2019 uh, 1160 puts going up this week as well. Uh, interesting Strike selection there. 11 half puts also active, about 1,000 of those. Dece 
2019 also hitting the boards there. If you're uh, a gold bug and you really want a uh, super optimistic strike and 1,400, 14 half, that ain't doing it for you, well, then you got 1,000 and change of the 1,700s going up this week as well, this time in September. So the September 1700s, a 1,000 times, um, pretty much all that opening this week as well. So, Nick, it's kind of a bit of a smorgasbord out here in, in June. Pick your month, pick your strike, and chances are somebody was slinging it this week. Interesting stuff. Uh, what, what caught your eye from a ball and from a skew and any other shining stuff perspective this week, sir? Well, I think my comment is just going to be that in response to you said, you know, people were looking if there's, if it's time to buy gold vol. And I, and, and I know from, from, from just experience and personal dissatisfaction early, early on in trading is that you always, you know, I think people have a penchant for wanting to be, wanting to be buyers and having it appreciate as opposed to being sellers and have it depreciate. And I think the reality is it's probably not even worth ever buying any volatility. Um, just because I looked at the, I looked at the rent for gold, for instance, and, and, uh, and the ranges even today were, were worth it, right? We have the change over rent and the range over rent. So the net change was positive, meaning that um, what you paid for that straddle um, or for, for the, for the, for the, not necessarily straddle for, but for that strike, for that, the money strike, you, you got back in, in, in movement and same thing for the, for the change that's significant, right? Cause that's just where you are right now and the range even more so. So there was a, a, a you know, the range is typically going to be bigger than the change. Um, but you know, you have to, you know, you own that, but you have to be actively trying to do something, um, in order to, make that money back, right? So you have to be scalping the gamma. So you're really not buying volatility there, you're buying gamma, but the, but when you look at it from where things are in the week, you know, vol's in. So if you have the ability to kind of stay the course and and let the, let the range in the underlying kind of habits have its way, you you were better off being short even at the even at these lower levels. So I don't know. None of my equity option purchases any do in fact if i would have taken every equity option purchase that i made and just sold it i would have made more money than just buying the stuff so i guess i'm just talking out loud to <laughs> are myself you, you come into the dark side on volatility is going to start hitting all the bits <laughs> well, i've always been a natural long uh, just because i was more of a short long vol short long dated vol and long front dated vol just for the you know gamma versus the vol play and and you know what and now, now I'm talking on a podcast about trading. So you tell me how that worked out. In any case, um, what's what's interesting here? Vol off. We're not near. You know, we we're we're still kind of really on the bottom low end of our volatility range. So uh, not much happening there. Uh, we moved down ten ticks. Uh, so really, what happened is we kind of slid down the volatility curve. We didn't really have much of a change in the shape of the vol curve. We just really more slid down from. You know, the slope is it's it's more biased towards the calls and we kind of slid down from where we were without much of a change uh, in that shape of the curve. Um, as far as the skew goes, we did get um, we got. Uh, and I think this is going to be natural part of the way we moved along the volatility curve. We have calls are a little bit more expensive and the puts are a little bit cheaper. So we sort of moved from, you know. Uh, the high end of that, the high end, the higher part of the of the slope, a higher slope part of the curve, down to toward the a little bit more of the belly. So we're going to see a natural change in the in the way the quick skew numbers look, and uh, as well as the just the regular risk reversal, and just that natural change in volatility as we as we slid down the curve. So um, I don't think there's. I'm going to just double verify that first. Let's go back to the 13th and take a look at these vol curves in comparison to each other. And see, yeah, I mean, we we uh, last week, yeah, I guess we do have we have a shift and we have vol offered. So we have a shift in the curve and we also have vol off a little bit. So um, again, same thing we talk about, right? I mean, we go back, we have the same conversation in oil. We talk about seventy being a mark that we have to get through in order to see something happen. Uh, when's the last time we were through fourteen hundred? Uh, Let's take a look. When's the last time we were that high? Let me let me take a look and see the front, the nearby front contract, and look at the date range for gold. I'm gonna go 
uh, two years and take a look at that and see. I mean, we haven't been over 1,400 in two years, right? So until we get out of these ranges, it's probably it's just not worth it. It's just like be short a big strangle around these really uh, support and resistance points, and you probably do just fine. So we have to get back towards, I'd say, 1,300 to 1,250 in order to see any kind of worthwhile bid and volatility, and then above 1,400. I think we haven't been above 1,400 in so long. When we get to that point, then we, we might see an actual bid and vol that would work and, and, and be worth being part of. What do you think? You know, it's funny. It sounds like you're coming along. Uh, you're coming along to the dark side a little bit at a time. I could see uh, one of my old co-hosts for uh, for our volatility views program. I could see if he's listening right now, he'd he'd certainly have a smile on his face because you're coming along to his way of thinking. He always used to argue to me, Nick, that uh, options should be sold or not sold, that they should never be bought. It sounds like maybe you're uh, you're you're falling into his way of thinking, sir. It's not. You know, I think that there is a good. Uh, I still stand by my trade recommendation not, you can't even use that word my trade idea or my trade tactic where if you reach uh if you reach what you consider the bottom end of a range and you think it's oversold that it definitely makes sense to buy buy puts and buy futures down there because it's a way to trade the range and also trade volatility because typically when you hit the low end of that range you're starting to bounce on it people are hammering those strikes i believe the same thing for the upside you reach an upside, you think it might be overdone, but you're at a high end of a range. You can buy calls and sell futures. You can naturally scalp futures, and you're going to get the benefit of more than likely some cheap call volatility. And if you're wrong um, and the range continues forward, you bought cheap vol, and you can play on the upside there. So I think there are places to be long, and they're related to open interest ranges. They're related to price ranges. Um, but just from a general market, I mean, most of the time, nothing's going on, right? Most of the time we're waiting for something to happen, right? So probably most of the time, um, you're probably okay. But again, you know, the, you, you can say, all right, I'm going to do that. And then you could be wrong and get ripped at that point. But just looking at it, I mean, we're in, we're in a pretty more, more or less a pretty tight range. So when you're in a tight range, you could probably be short and cover yourself on the outside. But I still believe there are good long plays, just like I said. And I think that more playing when, is when, when it comes time, you buy the cheapest volatility, the cheapest Vega that you can buy and hedge it and trade futures that way with some protection. So I'm not quite there. Let's call it the gray side. You're, Let's call you're, it the, you're a gray Jedi as opposed to a Sith or a, uh, a dark side kind yes, of guy. There we go. We'll call it. We'll call it. Uh, <laughs> I'm a, I'm not quite 50 shades of gray. Let's call me like the 20th shade of gray. Uh, you know, I'm kind of, I'm not, not that far along yet. I like it. You know, I mean, we even said, but you know, we used to say, even if you are buying the ball, you do have to scalp the gamma fairly aggressively, right? So it's not like you can just buy the ball and, and set it and forget it. You have to babysit it. You have to be in there kind of pretty savvy. You have to have a pretty decent size account to be able to do those gamma scalps out there and have the margin treatment to be favorable for it and have enough reserve capital to do it. It's going to tie up a lot of cash to do it. So uh, we, at all those caveats aside, that's kind of what we used to always say when we were talking about the ball. But I could certainly see how you could uh, how you could come to that conclusion, sir. Speaking of conclusions, we have we have a little bit more time before we got to get to some listener questions. Uh, I know people like crypto. You got grains are moving a bit this week. What, what else is on your radar this week, sir? Um, I, let's let's touch on crypto. I think a little bit. We we haven't talked about that specifically in a while, but I think it's probably you know worth a little conversation. What do you say? Yeah, you know the folks out there. Uh, if they have their druthers, sir, judging by their email, we talk a lot of crude and some gold, but also just nonstop crypto all the freaking time, pretty much. They can't get enough of it. Of course, it has been has been rocking and rolling since the last time we really dug into it on the show. It's had quite the move. Of course, it got down to, I believe, around uh, the 6,000 level in that range out there in Bitcoin and on the CME futures out there. As we're speaking now, there's been quite the rally. Uh, we touched on it last week on the show. It seemed to have been driven by the... Uh, the uh, Middle Eastern kind of Sharia approval for uh, access to trading of these products and, you know, to the to the believers out there in terms of crypto. And there's quite a few of them that they said that opened the floodgates to nearly two billion more potential people to trade these things. So, of course, uh, the crypto caught a bid and we're seeing that bid continuing into today's session over there uh, with the CME futures up about 250 handles as we speak. You know, we asked you guys last week. 
Um, uh, well, well, actually, we'll, we, we can we can surface that now. Well, I was gonna save it for the listener mail, but we'll get to it now. We, I asked you guys last week, uh, you know, which product or segment do you think will experience the most volatility over the coming week? So this week through today, the twentieth of Friday, here on the close, uh, we gave you four choices. We gave you the S P five hundred, aka the VIX. We gave you gold. We gave you crude oil or Bitcoin. Which one's gonna have the most vol? Thirty six percent of you chose Bitcoin. And it's kind of hard to argue with it, given how much movement we've seen. We have seen a lot of changes in the VIX. VIX got annihilated over the beginning part of this week, but it started to creep up towards the latter portion of this week. So in the net, the move hasn't been as big. Uh, also, it was a tie, actually. 28% saying kind of S&P vol or crude oil vol. Uh, we did see a big move in crude vol, too, but not quite to the extent I think we saw in the other products. Gold lagging up the rear, only 8%. Uh, so a lot of you are, are buying this crypto vol in terms of it's here to stay for a while. And it seems like you're right. Also doing some decent paper out there. Remember, the CME contract has a five multiplier. So that's a big, beefy contract, five coins. Uh, you're talking $40,000 uh, right now at the current price level. So not exactly a mom and pop retail type contract. Still doing about 20, looks like about 23, 2400 contracts today. Uh, the lion's share of that coming in the front month with about 2100. Uh, we saw similar numbers, some of the other C uh, CME, or excuse me, some of the other Bitcoin futures out there doing decent papers. So these are not products that kind of traded once and they kind of went away. They're actually do, doing a fair amount of uh, activity there. Mr. Nick, I'm sure you guys and your team over there at QuickStrike are probably just still getting deluged and inundated uh, with requests and queries for more crypto data. You guys actually are some of the few people that actually have it. You actually have some of the crypto numbers, which is why I like talking crypto on this show more than the others, because we actually have the data to back it up here. Uh, but you have a lot on the B on the BRR and the rate that that's actually being used to derive these futures. How's our vol looking out there from a crypto perspective? Is it uh, is it up a bit since last time we talked? Yeah, I'm I'm looking at the different levels. We have the daily change and the and the 60 minute change. I think from a from a uh, you know from a long term perspective, yeah, the volatility is definitely up from the short term sort of. Um, Hourly and uh, quarter hour changes. It, we're we're probably at levels where, you know, we're we're seeing, we're not seeing like the sort of activity in a given short period of time frame, but we definitely have, are seeing volatility over the long haul. So we're probably around 92% right now for an at the money volatility with the actual long term. What do we got here? Um, next average last. Yeah, you know between you know, 80 and 90% volatility here right now. So, um, because we, you know, for a while we were seeing really, really choppy. So we're seeing, you know, short window volatility really high. So we're not seeing that same sort of real choppiness within, uh, within a given short period of time, but we're seeing, we are seeing increases day over day. So that's where we're going to see that. So that, um, that, that longer term volatility rise and that kind of short term intraday volatility be a little bit less. I think what to me is uh, what I found, what I think I, fi what I find most interesting, right? Obviously we're up from like 6,500 to 8,500, but m remember Ripple, which is one I pay attention to, Litecoin as well. Um, Just gonna say Ripple, about double. Ripple, yeah, Ripple, Ripple was below 50 cents. Um, uh, not, you know, a couple of weeks ago, it's almost 90 cents, 87 cents. So you're talking, you're talking a, a really significant percent move there. I mean, Litecoin's up probably almost uh, 30, 35%, something like that. And yeah, Bitcoin's up 20, 20, probably close to 20, 25%. So percentage wise, the, the smaller coins did, I think much better over this last little push up, but you know, that's also, it, it looks like you're getting at least watching, and this is a very unscientific statement, just from eyeballing the numbers and watching it, we sort of hit what I don't, again, I'll ask for your opinion on, on this as well. We sort of hit what we, we, we a, a steady low, right? When we hit these lows, it's kind of hitting a, an area, like ripples, like 50 cents. It'll bounce through that a little bit. Litecoin got down in the low, low hundred uh, mark. Uh, uh, you know, um, the Bitcoin was, uh, you know, we, we see around 6,000. It'll trend around. Yeah, you still have $200 moves, but, you know, you're, you're kind of within range of these certain things. So it feels like we're in a little bit steady of a market, not, not, and maybe that, maybe that's what the futures have done. They've tamped down that volatility and we see it. We see that short term volatility just from our numbers. It's much lower that intraday, intra hour uh, volatility is lower than it was before. 
And the longer term stuff is more kind of steady around the 80 to 90 mark. So I, I find that pretty interesting. Um, and I really, I, I look forward to the, I think, I think now, now more so than in the past, I look forward to options on this stuff because it's acting more normal. Does that make sense? No. Yeah. I'm with you hundred percent. I've, I've been, uh, champing at the bit here for a while to get my hands on some uh, Bitcoin options. What's the, uh, the infamous Buffett quote now? He says, uh, I wish, you know, I would uh, love to buy a put on Bitcoin, but I sure as hell don't want to short it. And uh, I'm with him completely there being naked, short, or even long the futures at this point. Uh, it's just, it's just not my bag. Those things are moving like cra- every time you check the ticker, it's another couple hundred handles in one direction or the other. So yeah, I'm, I would love to have the options on these things. You know, I've asked the, both of the big uh, exchanges put out the futures been on them for a while about when we're going to see the options. None of them seem super inclined to uh, to really want to. They move very quickly on the futures. Seem like they're pumping the brakes on the options a little bit, which is kind of interesting out there. So maybe some opportunities for people to get in there and start slinging these things up and create some other interesting stuff. A lot of people are writing in saying they want to see more in terms of other futures listed before there are options. I'm, I'm not in that camp. I'm definitely, I want to see options on the listed futures first. Then you can start listing all the other ones. Hey, how great would it be to have a future on Ripple, huh? Mr. Nick, that, that would be pretty great. Because you, you, know, you can't it, really it would, trade would, the freaking it, thing right now. You have to go through three different hoops to get it. Yeah, it would be cool. The problem, the only problem I see with that, I'm going to tell you, I'll give you a little, I'll, I'll see if I can push this out. Um, the only problem I sort of see with that is, hold on, give me a second and I will be there in a minute. I'm just going to pull it up. Um, so for instance, Ripple trading around 90 cents. So if we look at like a seven day option on it, actually, maybe it's not too bad. I mean, you're talking about a straddle that's worth like 13 or 14 cents on a seven day option on a 30 day option. Uh, you know, you're talking about 27 cents. So I guess the interesting thing about the ripple is that you'd have to go the, you'd, you'd probably want to get a bigger multiplier right in the contract. So maybe you want to, the future would be like a thousand ripple so you can start getting, or at least a hundred ripple. So you can start getting into, you know, instead of 15 cent stuff, it's $15 or something like that. So, it's um, but that you know, look, long-term at the money volatility on the Ripple over 30 days is about um, 136 percent. So that's not, it's not insignificant uh, from a volatility standpoint. But from a premium standpoint, in relation, you know, you're paying. I guess it's it's the same. It's all relative, right? 90 cent option to 15, you know, 27 cents for a straddle. That's a pretty significant amount of money you're paying for that, given that. But you also had that movement, right? We had a good chopping, and we had yeah, it's pretty saw, much doubled in the last month or so, right? Right. So any, any straddle you would have bought would have been probably really good. So, uh, so yeah, Ripple would be fun only because I think people get their heads around that denomination a little bit more. But, you know, who knows? Maybe they'll have options on fractions of a Bitcoin or fractions of Ethereum. Some, right? Nobody says that you got to have the full contract, right? So um, who knows? Yeah, I would love but, to have a full 1,000 multiplier contract on Ripple. I, I could hear you whispering in my ear when Ripple was back around 50 cents, uh, and I was I was tempted to dive into those waters. You know, one of the things you get busy, I didn't have time to jump through the multiple hoops to actually get the Ripple, and of course now it has doubled. So uh, there you go. You're happy, though. I know, I know you're, uh, you're a I Ripple. put some stops in. You're, I put some stops in down you, there, and, and I got okay. hit on a few of them. And then you get hit, and then you're like, oh, sh- <laughs> oh, no. oh, no. I got hit on my No, stops, no, no. But- There's no stops in crypto, Mr. Nick. You got to be 100% in, right? You got to be yeah, you got to be one yeah. of these. You got to be forget the gold bugs. These crypto believers are on another level. There is no stopping out in crypto. You just buy more. <laughs> yeah, right. So you yeah, exactly. Although you that gotta- can't go wrong, right? No. Well, you got to, I've, I've, if I haven't said it up, anything you do in that space, you got to be willing to lose, right? That's kind of how it is. So, um, but yeah, of all of them, I like I like that one just in general, just because from a practical standpoint, if you look at what Ripple's doing as a company, and and it's just the ability to do the cross border transactions very easily and very efficiently and very quickly, to me, that's where it is is that one. So, but that's my that's just my, you know, opinion. And I saw that guy talk at the Yahoo Crypto Conference. I think it's Brad Garlinghouse, and he was really good. So I like that. I like that crypto, and I like that company as well. You know, if you start ta- you go to one of those conferences, you start talking stop orders and crypto, they're they're gonna boot you right out of the room, sir. You're not uh, you're not no, you're I- not buying the, you're not you're not drinking the Kool Aid at that point. Speaking of drinking the Kool Aid, it's time for us to maybe drink some of yours. It's time for your futures options feedback. 
It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for Futures Options Feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody. Welcome. You know, when we get to the crypto portion, it's pretty much your listener mail portion because you guys got crypto on the brain. Uh, let's get to some of these. Uh, GW, this is interesting. GWCH asks, are uh, you guys buying that this hashtag cryptocurrency rally is based on the uh, Sharia law approval? Yeah, that's kind of what I said earlier. That it's rallying. That that seems to be what everyone's kind of broadly accepting as the reason. You know, looking for fundamentals in crypto sometimes can be a bit of a fool's errand. These things kind of move to their own rules of engagement quite frequently. But that that seemed to be the broadly based uh, you know reason why a lot of people seemed to be buying it. Uh, so yeah, that made that makes sense to me. A couple billion people coming online for a product that that opens up the pool to some potential bulls. Uh, Mr. Nick, are you buying that? Or do you think there's other reasons driving these big uh, rallies here? Oh, I don't know what I I don't know what I if I have a sense one way or another about that. I just think um I think it's partially probably that because everybody says it is right. So it's a little bit of a self fulfilling thing. And then also I think that you know the like we mentioned before, the prices have been rangy for so long and they've felt like um you know they felt like they had a pretty firm bottom. There may be some people that were just like you know what I I'm confident that we're gonna kind of stick around or that this is where we are that this is a good buying place as well. So I think that's part of it as well. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly when it got to that 6,000 level, that seemed to trigger a lot of people. Just we got to get back in. I mean, from 20,000 down to six, it's had quite the run to the downside. So uh, could have been a lot of bulls getting back in. Maybe some of all the people who had set stops like Nick, they all got stopped out. Now it's time for the bulls to get back in. That's could have been what it is, too. Uh, speaking of crypto, another question here. This comes from Kennedy. Uh, this probably came in like over a week ago, so maybe uh, maybe he missed the rally. Maybe he is believing this. Maybe he's regretting it now. He wrote in saying, Soros, so George Soros, is getting into crypto. Is it time to sell? Uh, George Soros, of course, infamously back, missed kind of the tech run of the 90s, and then infamously got into tech. Probably one of the worst time trades in history right around March of 2000. So uh, maybe our friend here implying that he's uh, he's a little late to the party in these things, and when he does... It signals the beginning of the end. Well, if that if his if he got in right around this thing started rallying, then uh, he may have actually had a pretty good timing on this one, at least so far. Particularly if he got into Ripple, the thing's pretty much doubled. I don't know, Mr. Nick, are you, are you selling what Soros is buying and vice versa here? Uh, I well, even though I had that Gartman comment before, I don't think you hang your hat on any any one individual, right? I think, uh, and plus, who's who's gonna like 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 uh, like you said uh, the quote before from. Um, uh, the Nebraska guy. I'm drawing a blank now. Lives in the, who is it? Uh, who did you mention? I'm, I'm, I'd like to buy puts, but I'm not going to sell it. What did you? Oh, uh, Warren Buffett. Warren, Warren Buffett, right. I was having a senior moment there. Right. Uh, or the Nebraska like see, guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just the Nebraska guy. Um, I'd like to see people get short here. I, I just don't see it, right? Yeah, it's easy to make that statement, but I don't think anybody's going to sell out this market just yet. Yeah, uh, certainly not. When that question came in, uh, Bitcoin was around the 6,000 level, I believe. So, uh, yeah, if you shorted it there, again, why? I wouldn't mind having some put options or just options in general. But I'm sure as I'm not going to step in front of the freight train by just shorting the futures. Uh, so, yeah, I agree with that Nebraska guy on, uh, on that one. Uh, this one comes from C C.T. Wills. Interesting comment. He's got uh, He says, the news of a 16th options exchange... Uh, makes me appreciate the predominantly centralized futures options market. With so many exchanges, it's hard to even get a 10-lot spread off these days. Oh, uh, yeah, you know, he's referring to the news that the Miami Options Exchange 
is uh, diving back into the fray with their third options exchange. Uh, it's not approved yet. It's probably going to come in Q1 of 2019. That would raise the total number of equity options exchanges to 16. And he brings up a good point that it is extremely, many would say overly fragmented on the equity options side of the space. And he's saying here, for him, it's hard to get 10 lot spreads. It does seem where spreads are where a lot of people, even uh, your typical active retail, seems like it falls apart for a lot of them out there. You can go out there and usually hit bids and lift offers or get close to them, work some orders, and get your 10 lots filled on most of the products out there. Some of them are a little less liquid. you got to work it a bit, but you can usually get that stuff done. But when it comes to spreads, sometimes, you know, you have different spread books, 16 exchanges, that many or close to that many different spread books all listing these orders. Sometimes one leg lines up somewhere, one leg lines up somewhere else. Your order is lost on the third exchange somewhere else. Uh, doesn't really, they don't fill it in time, doesn't line up. So it's all... There's a lot of issues with that fragmentation, uh, which makes it hard sometimes to get things done. And people are not exactly greeting the addition of a 16th exchange, I don't think, with a lot of enthusiasm uh, out there. But, uh, you know, it raises a good point that, you know, you don't have to deal. Uh, if you're going out to, the, to uh, let's say, WTI, for example, you know, you don't have to uh, worry about uh, your spread lining up in different places and not getting filled. So that certainly is uh, if you want uh, a deep one place to hit for a deep pool of liquidity, then uh, I guess CT Wills is onto something, Mr. Nick. You agreeing? Yeah, and I did. I did see that news again. And I guess I don't really think about it too much because I know there's a lot of them, but I don't think about it because I just, you know, you're using your platform and and you kind of you see where the you see where the bid nests are from what exchange they're coming from. But but it is a good point where it, it's just you you know what you're getting when you have this sort of single. I mean. You, you know what you're getting. You got the single behemoth exchanges, right? But then again, you have the single behemoth exchanges. So I guess there is a, a positive and negative to both sides of the argument. But, uh, um, but yeah, I can understand that. I, I, I just don't know how they how each of them coming on thinks they're going to, you know, improve the mousetrap and, and, and make a dent in what's already a pretty, you know, spread out market. Yeah, you know, well, clearly they're – these exchanges can survive in, you know, sub 1% market share and, and make a living off that, apparently. So, yeah, it's interesting. That news, very contentious. I'm sure when I, contentious, I'm sure when I get down to the big options industry conference uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, that'll be a big talking point down there. Um, let's see here. You got time for oh, – here's one right up your alley here, Mr. Nick. Uh, Taz, Taz41 asking, uh, can the strategy screener tool – you mentioned that before on the show, Nick. Can the strategy screeners tool handle ratio spreads and iron condors? Uh, thanks for the great show and so many great tools. Well, there you go. A fan of uh, the tools you guys are putting out. And also a fan of the show, so you can tell. Good taste here for Taz41. Um, he's asking, Mr. Nick, can he specifically do ratios and iron condors in your screener tool? Uh, I don't think that I would tout that as being something that that you could just sort of plug in and see. I think that there's probably a, a couple of three tools that you can kind of load up and, and build things and then look at history and then sort of look around uh, it, within that product. But um, specifically from a screener for, for first of all, our screening to be perfectly honest, our screening is, is, is not, uh, is, is not that diverse. Um, it's something we're working on. So, but our tools are diverse enough where you can probably do your own screening, but there's no like magic button that you push in order to get that. So, but we're working on it. Just like, just like, uh, Mark has asked us, um, Mark Bryan on Twitter, how he's asked us for some, for some reports. We take notes and we do our best to try to bring those online as quickly as we can. So people have what they need in order to trade. Well, speaking of him, he's sending some love your way for, uh, he says, thanks. Well, thanks to me for presenting your request. You're welcome. And thanks to Nick for producing the report immediately. So he's, you guys clearly, uh, clearly solved his issue or answered his request very quickly. He says the three year, I believe he was asking for, what was it? 45 day uh, straddle run, something along those lines. He says the three year mid curve Euro dollar options were a challenge to learn, but I'm up to speed. Uh, he says these straddles are the richest so far. The cool how they expire in June, 2018. Uh, but uh, the best is not till 2021. Interesting. So there you go, Mr. Nick, uh, so, uh, a happy customer. Yeah, so what he's referring to is what the euro dollars have is uh, there's obviously there's 10 years of quarterly futures contracts. It goes whites, reds, green, blues, golds, purples, right? So the greens, what they have is 
they have whites, reds, and blues that are options that have expiration dates that tie to the futures, but they also have these mid-curve or short-dated options, which are short-dated options that, so they're one month, three month, six month, nine month, and one year, um, or, and, and, and variations in between with the weeklies and stuff like that, that point to a, a different part of the, of the interest rate curve um, but let you trade options on them because um, they used to not have that. So you were kind of just stuck with really long dated stuff. And, and typically that stuff was really expensive, but then you get short dated on a part of the curve that, you know, when, when interest rates are low and not moving, that's the part of the curve where people are speculating, right? So they're, they're further out on the, on the yield curve. Now, what's interesting, if you go look at the open interest on the Euro dollars, the activity is all in the, in the whites, which is in the first year, because that's where all the, that's where all the, Activity is going to be just with the tightenings and 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 and, and speculating what the Fed's going to do. But but yeah, the 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 col the colors the the uh, red green and blue those mid curve or short dated options and short dated you can equate that to the same stuff that's out in the ags for the corn and the wheat and the beans. Those are great products because they have an interesting future. So that underlying is going to exist even after the options expire. But it's also a part of the curve that is a little bit more. Um, you know, open to different kinds of uh, speculative movement based on news and Fed action and stuff like that. So yeah, there. If you if you get your handle on the on the euro dollars, then everything else is easy. <laughs> There's certainly some merit to that. You're right because uh, euro dollars a daunting. Uh, I can always tell you get that little sparkle, a little twinkle in your voice, Nick. We start talking euro dollars. You can always tell you're an old uh, old diehard. Diehard old school Euro dollar guy at heart. Unfortunately, listeners, that music means we've come to the end of another epic sojourn through the world of futures options. Man, we went all over the place, crude, got some gold, got a whole bunch of your crazy crypto in because you guys love your crypto. Probably more coming on that. We talked uh, exchanges, we talked products, we talked George Soros, Iron Condors, you name it. You guys took us all over the place, and we love it. Keep those comments. Keep those questions. You guys keep us on our toes. We couldn't ask for anything more. And Mr. Nick, <coughs> excuse me, we were just talking about all the cool stuff you guys are working on, including uh, people ask you guys for new reports all the time, and you generate them, and people are happy. So what can they expect coming down the pipe from you guys at Quick Strike uh, in the coming weeks, sir? Well, you know, don't forget we talked about that guy from Nebraska as well. So let's not. Oh, yes, I forgot. Him. Our <laughs> infamous friend from Nebraska. Nebraska. Um, what do we got coming? Well, there's some good stuff coming out in the next few weeks. There's uh, there's a new um, there's an, an options calculator, a, a universal calculator. So you could be able to do any kind of uh, option calculation. And there's also going to be a, a CME specific, a CME product specific calculator where you'll be able to pick the expirations and do side-by-side -side calculators and run calculations and keep a history of that. That's going to be a super cool, really useful tool that's coming out real soon. There's also an event calendar, so you'll be able to see all the economic events and also tie to them. It'll see all the options that expire on those event days. So you'll have some good ways of picking if you're going to buy options or sell options. You can see what interesting information is uh, available around their expiration date. So if you want to take something in the account, you can do that. Um, also coming is going to be uh, uh, an event volatility calculator. So you'll be able to look at a chart and it'll show you where that event is and what, what that volatility event looks like. Uh, from a vol standpoint and maybe how to take advantage of that as well. So some really some really good, solid uh, trading mechanics, trading knowledge, trading education tools coming um, in the next few weeks. There you go. You know where to find it, Bantix.com, B-A-N-T-I-X.com. Uh, Click on the uh, login to QuickStrike there to check it out for yourself. And, of course, you can always head over to our friends as well, cmegroup.com slash twifo. Check out what Nick and I were talking about on the show this week. If you like what you're seeing over there, click on the link and check out Quick Strike for your very own. And on behalf of Mr. Nick and our friends over at CME and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, all the fun stuff that you do. We love having you guys join us. It wouldn't be the same without you. And we'll see you next week for more of This Week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike Options Pricing and Analysis Software.
QuickStrike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy-to-use web-based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page-level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. QuickStrike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. QuickStrike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about QuickStrike at Bantix.com. That's B-A-N-T-I-X.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at QuickStrike1. That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rule book of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.